not all Israel is of Israel. The people that he, you can turn back to Romans 9, the people that he's addressing, they said, we be, we be of Abraham's seed. Well, here was the problem. They believed because they had the covenants and they had the promises and they had the law that they didn't need salvation. You want to know what a contradiction is? Or a hypocritical contradiction. Anticipating a Messiah. For what? If you're already saved and you don't need any more, then why are you anticipating a Savior? Can anyone answer that? Because they actually thought, we're good. We don't need you. We're good. We don't need anything you're saying, by the way. We're good. And anything that he was saying to them was rejected. Turn to Romans 9. And if you have a Bible like mine, you have a header above the ninth chapter that says the people of Israel. I don't know who wrote the headers. I'm sure it was the Zodiotes editors and from my Bible. Uh, sometimes they're good and sometimes they're terrible. This one's okay. So... While you're turning there, and we'll be in this area for a little while, there's a lot to digest here. I want you to think of Romans 9 as Israel's past, Romans 10 as Israel's present at the time Paul was writing and, and forward, and Romans 11 as future Israel. That's the best way to understand those chapters in that order. And it's not exact, but that's the best overview I can give you. Now, if you're not familiar with the book of Romans, as I said, this is a one-room schoolhouse. We've got advanced people and we've got beginners. But the book of Romans, let me just say this. The late Dr. Scott was right. This book is a manifesto. It is brilliant. Because what the apostle does, if you had no other book of the Bible, you would be missing out. But you could actually walk alone with the book of Romans because it takes you through sin, salvation. It takes you through all of these different concepts, faith versus works, practical applications which begin to appear from the 12th chapter to the 16th. So you've got so much in here, including what I'd say is a bridge, much like I've told you the book of Acts is a bridge between the Gospels and the epistles. The book of Romans is actually a bridge to help us understand, we'll call it the left out parts that maybe weren't elaborated on. Paul covers them. So, but before I get into the ninth chapter, I want to show you something really cool. So if you are in the ninth chapter, let me read a, f a couple of verses beginning, and then I'm going to go back into the eighth chapter for a second. So Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I wish, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. So put a period right there. If you just read that on its own, you'd say, wow, what a nice guy. He feels bad for his kinsmen. But it's more than that. It's deeper than that. And let me tell you why. There was no chapter and verse when this was written. It's a letter. We later put in chapter and verse. So I want you to think of this as one flowing document, one flowing letter. So if you go back a little bit and write about, you know, this 31st uh, verse, you know, what shall we say then to these things? If God before us, who can be against? And if you read through that from 31 to 39, he says in verse 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then, jump right into the ninth chapter. He says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My consciousness also bearing witness in the Holy Ghost, I have great heaviness continual sorrow, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, an anathema, uh, from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. I want you to think about that continuous flow, because people have read this and been perplexed. How could you say, nothing shall separate us, and then say, but I would be accursed for my brethren's sake? 
And let me explain to you. The love of God flows from these verses, 31 through 39, telling us how much God loves us, right into Paul's heart and out of his mouth. How, think of this, how much would you love God that you would be willing to go to hell to save somebody, if that's the way it worked. It doesn't work that way, but you'd be willing to go to hell to save a lost person. And you tell me that's not love. So the love of God that flows out of those final verses flows into his heart with great heaviness. And this is something, I, I, wanna, I don't want to pass this by too quickly. It's something we can all relate to. He was talking about his brethren who are Israelites. And we know not all Israel are Jews. In fact, he distinguishes and uses the term Jew earlier in verses two, uh, chapters 2 and 3, I think. Here he refers to Israelites. Don't get confused. But here's the bigger thing. If you really look at what he's saying, many of us can identify. Don't put cameras on anybody. How many here know someone who thinks you're a nutty person because you go to church, you read the Bible, you have faith, and they think, I'm okay, you're the one with the problem. Sometimes it's people that are right next to us, it's people we love. You know how hard that is? When you love somebody, and it's not because you want them to become some cookie-cutter Christian, it's because you want them to come to know Christ, the Savior of the world, who can wash away sins, who can take you into eternity, who will be with us, who is with us now and will be with us forever. And if you really believe what the Bible says, you also believe about eternal separation. So imagine being married, because I know there are a couple here in this church, directly in the sanctuary. Husband believes or wife believes, husband doesn't. Lots of, always lots of tension because of the person's commitment, because of their tithing, because of whatever they do. And it probably is a boil inside you that festers perpetually. Why, God, why will you not open this person's heart and put your spirit in them so that we, whoever you are, can walk as one? Can two people that are supposed to be one flesh walk as one when they are separated by the division of flesh and spirit? It's a pain I, I know about all too well. It's a pain that never goes away. And the, the desperation to want people to come to know, to be interested, to read, to study, to join you in your walk, or even to just be alongside knowing that person is, is in same spirit. So I, I put that that way. And then let me give you another one, because there are so many ways to approach this. In 2000, when Dr. Scott was given his diagnosis of cancer, and very aggressive cancer. I was very still young in my faith, not, not quite where I am today, of course, in, in my understanding of things. And I prayed to God, put the cancer on me. He's needed. I'm not. Put the cancer on me. Little did I know that I was walking around with cancer in my body already, but that was my prayer. When, when, when you put things in priority, this is not some love out of control. This is a, an understanding about the things of God. This is why when he says, I, would, I wish that I could be anathema so that my brethren would be saved. But here's the problem with that. And he's going to go on to explain why it doesn't work that way. We can have deep grief. And trust me, I, I do. I read the letters of people who are in this church living every day with that. Or they don't agree with the way you are studying or who you're under studying under me. Well, I wouldn't listen to her. Good, don't. That probably, with that attitude, you probably would not be content listening to anybody, only those who fit your unique agenda of what you think is right, not God's word. 
So I can understand, when I, when I put it in perspective, I can really understand, if you go back and read those words again that Paul writes, they are filled with love and sorrow. And unfortunately, there's something that the, the body of Christ has actually lost. And that is that same burden for people, whether, they, whether you know them closely or at afar, for the lost. Especially in this day and age, there, there are so many lost people out there, by the way, that it's self-evident they're lost. But we just kind of say, well, you know, they're not going to listen anyway, so what can we do? And I've said, yes, you pray. You don't pray on the person, which is what most people do. You don't pray to their face, but you, you start asking God. And I do believe God answers prayers, but here's the thing, it's in God's time. And this book shows that. This, these chapters show that. And the Apostle Paul was wise enough through God's Spirit to know that even though that was his prayer, that's not the way things go. That in God's time, God will get, he will get around to dealing with Israel. Okay? So when people in the sound of my voice are listening to me, I don't want you to think somehow, well, God's done. Be very careful about thinking God is done with the people we identify as Israel. Now, let me get into the text here a little bit so that I want to make sure when you're reading this and you reread it, don't read it as a tough to digest. I want you to read it as this is Pastor Paul with an immense desire to see God enter in. And he will, by the way. He will. So let me start over again. He says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not my conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Spirit ghost or Holy Spirit, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption. Uh, here, you want to maybe make some notes if you would like. Uh, adoption here, the Greek word is basically sonship, okay? We used, we, we used to this, I think, what's, I'm probably not saying it right in conjugation. I know I scribbled it somewhere. Let me do that, otherwise I'll have people saying, that's not the right word. Uh, Weuthesia, sonship, okay? Uh, so to them was, it says, pertaineth adoption. If you go back and look, you know, we tend to take terminologies from the New Testament like sonship. And we don't necessarily apply it to the Old Testament. But if you remember, I believe it's in Exodus 4, verse 22 or 23, when God says that the children of Israel are like a son unto him. Okay? So that concept has always been there. Because the reflection of God the Father to the Son is also an implication of the Son to the children of God. So with these things, kind of interesting here. He says, they're Israelites who pertaineth to sonship and glory. And glory here, he's talking about the glory that they were privy to see. Remember, in the tabernacle, God's glory descended. God was with them. Fire, cloud, right? God's glory even to Moses. Well, that's a different story, but... We know that through the Old Testament, God revealed his glorious presence to these people. And then notice something interesting. And the covenants, plural, and it is plural. And the covenants. And so we're looking at, when it says covenants, we're looking at what was promised to Abraham, what was then passed on to Isaac, then passed on to, and we can keep going because many of the covenants, we simply think Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We don't think about things like Moses, who also, no, I'm not talking about the receiving of the law, but covenants that God spoke essentially promises, which Paul will go on to talk about as well. David. So they all received something like that from God, the giving of the law and the service of God, that Greek word, letteria, which is, can connote liturgical, but it can also connote worship and the promises. Let me just stop there for a minute. See, so he says, all of this were Israelites 
who basically received all this. Now he's painting a picture that basically says these people received great blessings from God. I think there are at least seven that I counted, six or seven, in just uh, verses four and a little bit of um, five, I think. And here's what's so tragic. He's looking at the past, which we'll keep seeing through the ninth chapter. And the crowning achievement, if you will, the crowning glory that would have been given to these people had they stayed the course was the coming of Christ, the Messiah. So the question, what I kind of started tapping into last week is, why did they reject him? If these are people who spent all of their life or most of their life or part of their life anticipating a coming Messiah, why did they reject him? Now we know it wasn't in the best interest of the religious leaders. They had everything to lose. Everything. If they acknowledged Jesus was who he said he was. Who would listen to them? They would lose all their power. They'd lose their money. They're just like the politicians of today. You don't think they were skimming and robbing the people of God back then from the temple, from all the collections and everything else? You're insane. They had everything to lose. So, like a government, trickle down to the people. And if you think about it, only the people who could receive Christ in the Spirit, even though the Spirit wasn't yet given like the day of Pentecost, only those that could receive him like that could receive him. Remember the opening of John 1, 11 we looked at last week, and 12. He came to his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him, he gave them basically the right, the power, the authority to become the sons and daughters of God with all the promises, with all the benefits, with everything attached. They just have to come by faith, right? So he's now cataloging all the things that they received. And he says, whose are the fathers, the patriarchs? That word in the Greek leads you back to pat, a, a cognate of pater, patriarchs. And of whom is concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God be blessed forever, amen. And then we go on to read something kind of crazy. He says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Oh boy, that's a chock full of nuts there. What are we going to do with that one? Okay. So first let me walk you through a couple of things here. What I love about what, how this was, it was obviously written by Paul, but the Holy Spirit's guiding the mind and the pen as he's writing. So what we have here, his expression of grief, of sorrow, he desires for them to be saved. And now he recaps, these are people, basically they had it all, they had it made. You know anybody like, I, I hate to say this, but you know anybody who, you look at them, you say they had, it ev they had everything and they basically squandered it. You know anybody like that? I do. No, plenty of people like that. That's kind of what he's saying, but it's on a different level. Squandering is nothing compared to basically rejecting God. So when he says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. In other words, we know that the word of God will not return void. So he's saying, don't think for a minute that God's word wasn't effective, didn't have the power. Don't think that for a minute. And What's so crazy about this is that if you go back and you start reading certain personages in the Bible, you can clearly see people were affected, changed, transformed, old and new, by the presence of God, by the power of God, okay? So the first thing he's trying to make an argument, do not go there. Don't say, well, then God's word couldn't be so. He says, don't even go there. But he says, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now let me, instead of trying to parse this, let me show you something that will better explain. Turn to John 8, please. This will kind of hopefully paint a clearer picture, and then I can maybe elaborate some more. So, in John 8, 
you have a whole exchange. Uh, this is Jesus having conversations, and the people he's conversing with says clearly that they are Jews standing before him in this exchange. So, it says, they understood not, verse 27, that he spake to them of the Father. Then Jesus said unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall, then ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now listen to this exchange which will explain what we're looking at in Romans. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, we, and we never we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I send to you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now here's a key statement. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. Stay there. Don't, don't turn, don't, you stay in John. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Now listen to their this back and forth. They answered and said unto him, Abraham's our father. Jesus said unto him, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. Second time, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said, If God were your father, you would love me. Now, if you keep reading the rest of this passage, it makes it abundantly clear. Not all Israel is of Israel. The people that he, you can turn back to Romans 9, the people that he's addressing, they said, we be, we be of Abraham's seed. Well, here is the problem. They believe because they had the covenants and they had the promises and they had the law that they didn't need salvation. You want to know what a contradiction is? Or a hypocritical contradiction. Anticipating a Messiah. For what? If you're already saved and you don't need any more, then why are you anticipating a Savior? Can anyone answer that? Because they actually thought, we're good. We don't need you. We're good. We don't need anything you're saying, by the way. We're good. And anything that he was saying to them was rejected. Now, the concept that Paul is saying here, remember, Saul of Tarsus, zealous Jew, Israel, was able to have his eyes opened by Christ and see the way, the truth, and the light in Christ. He was Israel and of Israel. That means that there are two groups of people that, he's, that Paul is talking about. Those that God placed something on them to have their minds and their hearts open and those, their eyes will be blinded, they will not see, their ears will be, the passage I'm talking about, they won't be able to receive. Not all Israel. Do not make this a statement that so people have interpreted this in a very weird way. But if you keep reading, it becomes even more clear. And I'll come back to this verse because I think it needs further elaboration. So take a look here. He goes on to say, Neither because they are of the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, there's something very remarkable about that verse. Actually, there's several things that are remarkable, so forgive me. The first one is when he says, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. And that word called 
is used in many different places. Kleto is the key word to call. We get our, even our word for church, ecclesia, from that. So in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So when we talk about the promises, and you go back and you start to understand why he is going to bring this up. In fact, all the way to verse 14, an argument is being made by Paul that is polemically sound, if you want to put it that way. And here's what he's saying. If you know the story, first of Abraham, God gave the promise to Sarai and to Abram that they would have a child. Now, had they waited, had they waited on God to make good, the whole Hagar-Ishmael incident would have never happened, okay? And had they not recognized the error in their ways, they would have been classified as Israel, technically, the Israel that refuses to listen to God, that rejects everything that God says, but I stand stout and proud that I am saved in my title, my identity, okay? So what's being driven here, he makes the first argument about Isaac. Pay another, there's another key word here. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Well, I'm going to make a lot of enemies today. The word seed here is where we get our English word for sperm, sperma, in the Greek. Every time Paul talks about seed, it's sperm. And that's why I keep telling you, get out of this matrilineal stupidity, even in the New Testament. There's only one place where we, we read and somebody could make the interpretation. Well, we're going to look at that passage too, but you can't make a case for matrilineal. Even, I'm sorry, but sperm is sperm, and sperm never came out of a woman. Okay, just putting a period right there, no pun intended. All right. <laughs> I don't know, that one just came out, so don't blame me. <laughs> but if you know the story, Sarai was barren. She was elderly and barren. And God specifically said, I will come back next year and visit you. You will have a child. And the implications there are you and Abraham are going to do the deed and produce a child. It'll be a miracle child, but it'll be done the natural way. But they were impatient. I know the feeling sometimes I'd like to come up with a method to speed things up with God, get impatient, take matters into your own hands. And as has been said before, you know darn well that Abraham did not need his arm twisted to go into their tent or their hut with Hagar and produce Ishmael. But the point that will be driven home here, when Paul says, that is, they that are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. And if you go back and you look at all that, this is where the separation of understanding begins. Both children came out of Abraham's seed, Ishmael and Isaac. God promised Isaac. You might say, well, that's not fair. But God didn't say, take Hagar and go make a child. He said, I'll come back and visit you, and you will have one. They laughed. So the important thing to understand is in that passage, we see clearly there is a concept being rooted there. It is not by natural or even by descent or by lineage. Remember, even that quote that I just quoted out of John 1, 12. Sorry, because my brain is a little bit overwhelmed, but let me read it to you because there lies your proof text of all of this. But as many as received him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God." You can will all you want. You can, hmm, it's not going to make it God's doing. So he's basically explaining that to us. Now, if you go back in Genesis and you read the whole passage between Sarai and Abraham, 
it begins to really crystallize that God was not sorting out, as much as we think he was sorting out a people to make them chosen, we've always done this, everybody does, well, the Jews are the chosen people. There were no Jewish people then. What he was doing is singling out a way that would be everyone born from that time forward in that promise would become children of God, not by way of taking matters into your own hands, not by works, not by effort, but by trusting and believing that when God says he'll do something, he'll do it. Now you've got an explanation, even more so by Paul, in the book of Galatians on this very subject, where Galatians 4.21, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Bondmaid Hagar, free woman Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. Now, I want to make sure, forgive me, this should be self-evident, but maybe it's not. Does everyone understand what that means? Yes. Give me a good yes or a no. Yes, sir. Okay. So he who was born of Hagar was born after the flesh. That wasn't a promise of God. That was them saying, well, you know, God hasn't shown up yet, so we'll just do this thing over here. And, and maybe that'll be, you know, remember Abraham, oh, that Ishmael may live, right? He loved Ishmael. I don't blame him. But that wasn't God's way, and that wasn't God's word, and that wasn't God's promise. God is looking to see if we will stand on what he says. Is his word valid? Is it, is it, is it enough to us to stand and believe that he is able? So he says, but, but he of the free woman was by promise. Sarai to produce and bring forth Isaac, which things are an allegory. For these two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which is now and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate, desolate hath many more children than she which has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. He's talking about everything that comes after. So when we recognize this, it's important to understand. He says, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him, that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. So you tell me, Back in the day when Paul was walking the earth, after he'd made this switch to be the heralder of the good news, that he didn't suffer persecution from the children of flesh, his own kinsmen. This is what's being said. So when we ask, why did they reject? They were given all this. Why could they not see? If, if you even have an inkling of the promises that are in what we call the Old Testament, you would have seen it if you were really operating in the realm that God is alive and he's the living God with all power. You would have seen it. You would have received it. But instead, you stand in a corner like the Pharisees that they were saying, we're saved by our traditions. We're saved by our law. We're saved by our lineage. We're saved by descent because we identify as such. Here's our nomenclature. We're saved by that. Don't need you, Christ. So if you understand what's being said here, it's starting to give us an explanation. But he's going to take this to another level because you have to remember, Ishmael was born of the same father, but we have Isaac being born of the same father, but two mothers, all right? Hagar bore Ishmael and Sarai bore Isaac. So he's going to take the argument in a different direction now. To, to, to hammer home, somebody, might, somebody listening might say, but well, well, wait a minute, same father but different mother. How can you make this argument? Oh, well, then he's going to nail this on the head. Watch this. He says, for this is the word of promise. At this time I, will I come and Sarah will have a son. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. This is interesting because he changes the argument. Instead of going to Abraham, 
one father, two mothers, he's now turning to the real argument to show how this all works. It goes to Rebecca. If you know the story of Jacob and Esau, they were in the womb, fighting, struggling, striving. Do you remember that? Everybody should know that passage. If you don't, please go back and read it. And God basically says this, the elder shall serve the younger. That's so powerful that God would make that declaration while they were in the womb. It says, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that called. In other words, God has the power to do what he's going to do. Don't read this as everything's wound up. This means God is sovereign, and when he says a thing, he makes it come to pass. So, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Now he goes from the argument, as I said, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, to Rebekah and Isaac, same father, same mother, and in the book of Genesis, it says two nations are in your womb before they even came out. How could God know that? Well, God's all-knowing, right? But the argument now is driven that if all Israel is, it, it's all the same, then why did two children come out, two nations come out? They went in two very different directions. If you know your Bible, the descendants of Esau will be a very interesting, it's a cascade of different peoples, but there is one unique group that stands out in descendants of Esau. And that's the Edomites, descendants of Esau. So take a look at, and when Paul says, not all Israel, I want you to think two, two children born in the same womb who should have come out as both eventually. Israel was not yet, right? Correct? If you know, Jacob comes after Isaac, right? Then Israel comes, all right? Jacob, who becomes Israel. But in the concept, I want you to think about this carefully. Two nations are in there. They should have come out to be essentially even, right? God-fearing, with the same mindset, kind of the same grouping. But we know that the line that descends are several lines from Esau, and there was a promise given there, too, for Esau. He's got a lot of different lines. But that one descending line brings us to the Enemites, and probably the most famous of these, I mentioned last week, I believe, which some people can conflate or get confused with the Edomians and the Edomites, but Herod the Great was an Edomite. That's a descendant of Esau. Herod the Great seeking to kill every child in, in, in the land at the time of Christ, including Christ. Do you see not all Israel? These are basically from the same stock, but honestly, you can see now the argument being made. Now, you can take this application out of Israel, away from the Bible, and look at Christianity as a whole. And forgive me, but I am trying to make this clear, and I'm not sure that I'm going to achieve this purpose. The great reformer Martin Luther, Protestant reformer, before the Reformation began, he was frustrated. His life was turned around by what? By going back into the book and rereading something very crystal clear. The just by faith shall live. That re revolutionized his life and the Augustinian monk that was following in the steps of basically what was the only church then recognized that the church wasn't even on track. It was so far from the word of God that the fire that began in his belly basically is why we are here as Protestants today, because he desired to get back to the word of God and not the doctrines and fantasy traditions of the Catholic Church. So you could make the same argument by saying Martin Luther trusted God's word and our Lord Jesus Christ to guide him versus, I'm sorry, you may get offended, but it is what it is, versus the history of the Catholic Church, which has been very dependent on selling indulgences, peddling lies, venerating things that God said, do not venerate ever, instead of teaching the truth. We could say not all Christians are Christians. And that would be a true statement. How dare you? 
Well, I just did say it because that's the reality. We've got a sea of people out there. Everybody has a little bit different. I don't care if you have a little bit different practice than me. I'm not going to, I don't condemn you if you, if you want to light candles in your house or if you want to play, you want to play that music, you want to get on your knees and pray, you want to squat and pray. I don't care what you do. But when it comes to doctrine, theologically, it is Christ. If you want to add to this, the triune God, the blood of Jesus Christ. And don't you dare add a thing more to that. And if you're going to add anything, it's going to be that you faith that that is so. Well, the Catholic Church, it wasn't enough. And we've got a lot of Catholic listeners, so some of these are honest to know what I'm saying is the truth. You weigh out a man like Martin Luther who is more concerned about the Word of God, like the prophet Elijah, versus at the time the Catholic Church was more concerned about filling its coffers by getting money kind of in the more usurping way, criminally deceiving and cheating people. So you can make the same argument to other people, but here he's making it to Israel. And he's saying, don't, glue, don't lump them all together. Some of them had the capacity to respond. Many did not. I hope that's clear because that's an important part of the argument. Now, people have a problem with this. Jacob, I have loved. Esau, I hated. Funny that Paul picks that up. It's even written in the book of Malachi. And I think there's one other place where it's written, maybe in the book of Genesis itself. But in any case, do not read that as it appears in the English language. It's better to say, for example, we have here, Jacob I have loved, the word is agape, Esau I have hated. It would be better to say, God preferred Jacob over Esau. He had a favorite. You know, if you have kids, you don't want to have favorites, right? You love them all the same. But this is a little bit different. Only God could know that one of them would be what the book of Hebrews says, do not be like that profane person Esau, not discerning spiritual things. That's what we're talking about. These people were spiritually blind, they were spiritually dead, but yet whited sepulchers, as Jesus called them, full of dead men's bones inside, busy approaching and applying the law to the, the washing of cups and hands, but inside, God's, God's presence did not live. This is what's being spoken right here. So when we talk about, and I, forgive me, but you know, a lot of people get very uptight when I touch these things. Oh, how dare you? The reality is, God even foretold through the prophets about Christ's rejection. You really read the book, you really see it crystal clear. God already saw that coming. And so a lot of times we say, well, it doesn't make sense to me. But this had to happen this way, because had it not happened this way, as I said, can you imagine another scenario? Can you imagine rewriting this book? He came to his own, and his own received him. What would that have looked like? I don't know. But thank God it didn't work out that way. That means we got to be included. We got to be grafted in. God included us. In fact, God said, you know what? I paid all this attention to you, my favorite children. I loved you. I spoiled you. I, I did everything for you. But you know what? You rejected me. You treated me like, you know what? Stay right here. And you might have to stay here for a little while. A little while could be a couple hundred years, maybe who knows much more than that. But you stay right here. I'm going over here to talk to these people over here, whether that comprises of the lost house of Israel, the Gentiles, the barbarians, the Greeks, I don't care. I'm going over here where people are ready to receive me. I'll be back, not like Arnold. I'll be back. <laughs> and when I come back, you're in for a real surprise, friends. But stay there in your ignorance, in your blindness, in your deafness. Stay there. So when you ask, why are people still practicing Judaism? There has to be a remnant right now practicing Judaism, by the way. Because if Judaism wasn't being practiced anymore, when we get into the final chapters of Ezekiel, when we get into the book of Revelation, 
you begin to see the necessity of why God kept a remnant back there, still can't see, don't know, we're, we're going to keep doing the law, we're going to keep doing our thing, although the sacrifices aren't being offered anymore, and a lot of the practices that should be done if you're going to do that aren't, and people find ways to bend the law, right? Dropping a handkerchief to be able to walk a little further on the Sabbath. You tell me that's concerned about God. And if you think that's concerned because you just dropped something as a legalist to say, well, I'm not only supposed to go this far, but I dropped one of my possessions here so I can go this far from my possessions. So I'll keep doing this and God says it's okay, so it must be okay. That's called nonsense. That's called hypocrisy. That's called not all Israel is of Israel. Does that make sense now? Because that's what Paul is hammering. So, as we move into the body of this, when he says, Jacob, I've loved, but Esau, I've preferred Jacob, all right? It's not because of love and hate preference. It's because God, who was able to see, saw that in Jacob, now Jacob went about it the wrong way. Jacob was the heel catcher, he's the conniver, he's the deceiver, but he still went after the blessings that God was supposed to bestow upon, in his mind, Esau. Remember, Esau sold his birthright blessing for a bowl of cereal or pottage or soup or whatever it was. That means he really valued it, didn't he? Right? Do you get what I'm saying? So, some of Israel looks like Esau. Well, I, this is my lineage. I come from this line. But God is not in the equation. You may say, Jacob went about things the wrong way, and he sure did, but guess what? His heart all along was for the blessings. Of, even though he obtained them in a very usurpful way, he still desired the things of God. And God, after God crippled him, after he wrestled with the angel, and God, the angel of God, whether it's a theophany, a Christophany, that said, what's your name? finally uttered, Jacob, your name shall no more be Jacob, but Israel. And whether that means, whether Israel means a prince with power, a prince that walks with God, God governed, there's so many different ways to peel apart this word. Maybe one day we'll study it. I don't know. It doesn't matter. What it's saying is that God was with him. God was leading him. God was guiding him. Even though he made a lot of blunders and did a lot of crazy things, God was in it. So then what you begin to see is the reason for including this is he's then, if somebody's going to make an argument and say, well, you gave the argument of Abraham, and Abraham is father of many, right? He's Muslim, Jew, and Christian. We all look to him. Well, here's a singular, singularity, if you will. Rebekah and Isaac produce Jacob and Esau, and it is the line descending from Isaac to Jacob that was essentially passed down as another promise, covenants plural, to produce the children of Israel. And in that grouping of even now, now we'll get into another group. So you've got Esau and Jacob representing the people in general, and then go down into a microcosm of that, which is the children of Israel themselves. And we know all the children of Israel were not Jewish, and all the children of Israel become We've covered this. Scattered peoples across the face of the earth. God knows where they all are. He does. We don't. So the argument now being made is this came out of one womb from one seed, from essentially one man and one woman, not multiple difference or whatever, to make the argument even more so. So he concludes by saying, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? I love this because this is very typical Paul when he writes, God forbid. The Greek says, me let it never be. Is there unrighteousness? Is God unfair? Is he, un, is he unjust? Is he not looking at this in the proper perspective? He says, no way. So if you see what he's saying here, it becomes crystal clear. There are people within this realm that could receive, could acknowledge, could understand. Look at the disciples of Christ most of them being of the Jewish faith. And you've got people like Nicodemus or uh, Joseph of Arimathea, and probably there were a bunch of other people that are not named here. They could see, they could receive. Meanwhile, the bulk of these kinsmen could not. 
So you start asking the question, did God actually make this to be on purpose? And the answer is found in here. It tells you distinctly. God has always had a plan. You know, the unfortunate thing is we, we tend to act like God doesn't have a plan. God always had a plan. He still has a plan. And when you consider what's, what, what the argument, this part of the argument concludes at verse 14. He's going to keep going. I don't want to keep going today. I want to kind of pause right here. But I think it becomes crystal clear. Go back and read about Rebecca and Isaac. And it starts with both, by the way, both women were barren. So when we talk about God honoring his word, he gave the promise to Abraham, high father will become father of many. Please don't say God's word has none effect and is not so and is void because we've got so much proof here that God, when he said it, he made it come to pass, just like in creation. But say, we weren't there to see it. But other people were around in the day of Abraham and Sarai who might have said, hey, these were the elderly crazy people talking to themselves out on the plains of Mamre somewhere, right? Instead, they were not crazy. It took them a little bit. Remember, there were a couple of lies, there were a couple of bad moves, but when it became crystal clear and God's word was suddenly everything changes. You see the same thing with Isaac, you see the same thing with Jacob, and we keep going. So I'd say to you, so far, what Paul is pointing out is that these people were recipients of everything that God could possibly provide, and yet they wouldn't. Now, we'll go on to study, and I will go on to show you that if we can put all the scriptures together, you will see that God is not done First, I'm going to put this separately. God is not done with Israel, and God is not done with the Jewish people, but they are not the same. And please take note. If you go back, I believe, into the third chapter, Paul's pretty clear to talk about Jews in one place and Israel in another. And I've already spent weeks defining this. So he's talking about his kinsmen and making a blanket statement, which could encompass both scattered and those who are practicing Judaism at this time. That's what needs to be kind of put there. So I could say this a different way. There are promises in Jeremiah. Many of the prophets said God would take the heart of stone out and put a heart of flesh, or he would circumcise the heart. Until God does that, no one can receive. This is why I've said this before, and I'll say it again. It's important for us to understand all people at the end of time, not all people will be saved. So when I say Israel will be saved, I don't mean all Israel. It can't be. Just like saying, that's like saying all Christians will be saved. That's up to you individually. What you believe in your heart, there are people who are Christians in name only. They do not know who God is. They don't read the Bible. They think being a Christian is celebrating Christmas and maybe Easter and put a period there and that's all. There's no praying, there's no communion, there's no giving, there's no sacrifice, there's nothing versus those that basically it, it becomes like a, a hunger or a thirst. You know, when you're, when you're thirsty, you can't stop drinking water. It's just like that, except when you start drinking of this water, you don't thirst anymore. You recognize the answers are here. But until you get into that, you're, you're going to be like everyone else. And this is why Paul also talks about a new creature in Christ Jesus. When we make that turn, God proveniently enters in, and somehow we become new. Don't ask me how. But I can tell you about Melissa Scott and say the Melissa Scott standing before you is not the Melissa Scott that Melissa Scott once knew, right? Same is true of all of you who press in and recognize I'm filthy. I'm nothing in God's presence, in God's eyes. But because I phase, because I trust him, I'm made worthy by the blood of the Lamb. He has chosen to redeem me for whatever the reason why I don't know. And I'm not complaining, by the way. I'm not complaining about that, all right? So what I want to say to you right now to kind of bring this message to a close is this. The starting point of understanding the argument is Paul saying these people had it all. They were given everything. And they blew it. Now, he's going to walk us through some other lessons here of Israel's past. We'll call it Israel's failure, not God's. And if you think that this section 
is focused on the people. It's not. It's focused on what God intended to do and what God will do. Keep that focus and you won't get confused. It is never about the people per se because why? We're constantly we're changing. Some of us for the better and some of us for the worse. So I would say this to you. I've come to know this over the years from standing here. There are people who will listen to me. Bring it down to this small little arena right here. Some people will listen to me and say, I don't know what the hell she said. I'm confused. I got to go to Floppy Eye Church because that's all I can understand. <laughs> or you all remember Rufus Glitter Teeth or the likes of it. I got to go to a Rufus Glitter Teeth Church. Jesus loves you. You're amazing. Have a blessed day. I'll tell you what, yeah, I, re I recognize that not everybody can receive what I do, but even the ones that say, I don't understand fully, but I'm listening, those are the people that belong to God. Some tune in and they don't understand, doesn't mean they don't belong to God, but the receiver may be not tuned into the right frequency just yet. It requires this receiver to be tuned in to exactly the right frequency to be able to listen and hear and receive. So let's see how Paul unfolds all of this. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised that he doesn't take any crazy turns here. He lays it out and will explain in great detail as we go why we are still waiting for the salvation of Israel. But mark my words on this. When God says, I will do something, I will send my word, I will make it come to pass. God's word shall not return void. Trust me on this. There is a greater probability that those people that were told, I'll be back, their descendants will keep practicing and their descendants will keep, I'm not talking about the marginal Jew. I'm not talking about the occasional Jew or Jew in name only. I'm talking about those committed ones to presently keeping the law like they think they are and doing all the practices as they think they are, they will be pleasantly surprised, shocked, and in a stupor when Christ appears and says, you are my children too. You are my children too. Now, I, this is what I do believe. When Christ returns, specifically for these non-believers, when I say non-believers, non-believers in Christ, I really do believe Christ will be wearing something very recognizable. And you say, well, you think when Christ comes back, the nail piercings will still be there? Yeah, actually I do. You know why? God will make sure there's no possibility of making sure these people know what they rejected. And that's why Zachariah says, the look on him whom they pierced and mourn. I don't look forward to seeing a people who's based their whole life on something that is completely done away with to go, oh, wow, you mean we wasted all this time when we could have been doing this? But that's right now how Paul is laying this out. So if you'll come back next week, we'll see how we can make this all make more sense. But for right now, that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.